Good morning. <laughs> Welcome everybody to worship this morning. Uh, a few quick announcements uh, before we begin worship uh, today. Uh, we will not be having Kingdom Kids this afternoon. Instead, we will be having our Easter egg hunt at 3 o'clock. Um, all are welcome. Um, so that'll start at 3 and maybe an hour, hour and a half. Parents, if you kind of want to hang around, um, we'll see just how long that takes us. But it'll start at 3 this afternoon. Um, this week, we will not have Wednesday night Bible study. However, we will have our Monday, Thursday service with communion uh, this Thursday at 6 p.m. Uh, next Sunday is Easter. Wow, how time flies. <laughs> um, and so we will be decorating the cross out front on Easter morning. So if you have any flowers in your yard, a relative that has them, or want to go to the store and get some, whatever you'd like to do, uh, we ask everybody to bring some. That way we can decorate the cross uh, next Sunday morning before worship. Uh, just to remind people of there's new life uh, in Jesus Christ, who is risen again. Um, also, Silver in the City um, outdoor worship service will be on the 14th. We will have a meal following that as well. Uh, baby shower for Katie Blanton and Caroline Wilson will be on the 21st of April at 2 p.m. Um, a couple announcements that are not in your bulletin. Uh, next Sunday, with it being Easter, we will have no Sunday school. Uh, I know a lot of folks have family plans afterwards, so... Uh, we won't have Sunday school next week, but also this coming week is uh, Holy Week, so they will have Holy Week services here in town uh, at the Good Shepherd Episcopal Church. Those start at noon, uh, Monday through Friday this week. So if you'd like to go, I know there's a few folks that are planning on going. Um, you get together, and y'all could plan on uh, going this week. Um, all that to say, that's our announcements here today as we've come to worship our God. Let us now be called to worship by His Word as we're called to worship from Psalm 118, verses 24 through 26. Hear now God's word. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, indeed, we bless you here this morning. Not that we can add anything to you, but we can give you the praise and the glory that you deserve. Lord, as we come here today, we are reminded that you are the mighty God. You are the creator. You are the great king that rules over us, that cares for us, and provides each and every day. You are the all in all, the alpha, the omega, the one who deserves our praise. And Lord, here today, we pray that you would help us to do just that. Help this be a time of glory and of honor that all goes to you. Lord, help us to set aside all our worldly plans and distractions, and may this be a time that we can give you the honor you deserve. And Lord, may you feed our souls here this morning to go out this week to live for you. And so, Lord, we pray that all will be done here and this time will be honoring and glorifying to you. For your name's sake and for our good, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Body, want to stand together. Our first hymn this morning is number 185. Hosanna, loud Hosanna. Hosanna, loud Hosanna, the little children sing. Through pillared court and temple, the joyful
Our Heavenly Father, you are indeed the giver of all good things. You are the one that has provided us with all that we need in this life. And Lord, we now take a moment to give back a portion to you, what you have given to us in the first place. Lord, with these tithes and these offerings, we pray that you would give us a giving heart, trusting in your care. And Lord, that you would use these for your glory, for our good. Lord, give us wisdom in how we use them. Lord, may we use them in a way that is honoring and glorifying to you, that is edifying and encouraging to our people, and Lord, that it shows the gospel to those around us. Lord, we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy We come this morning and we confess the God that we believe in. We confess that Jesus Christ is our Lord. He is our great King. As we remember as he went into Jerusalem and they were waving the palm branches, he is indeed the King who has come, the King who deserves our hearts and all of our lives, the King that we trust in for our salvation and to take care of us each and every day. That's the God that we believe in. And so Christians this morning, I ask you in whom do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, in his Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, from thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Our first scripture lesson this morning comes from back from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 21, verses 22 and 23. Hear now God's word. And if a man has committed a crime punishable by death, and he is put to death, and you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain all night on the tree, but you shall bury him the same day. For a hanged man is cursed by God. You shall not defile your land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance. Let's pray together. Oh, Heavenly Father, you are the God that cares for us. You are the God that has provided us all that we need. And you are the God in which we find our hope, find our joy, find our peace, and everything else. And Lord, as we look to you, we are baffled that you would still love us in this way. For Lord, as we see ourselves, we see our brokenness, we see our shortcomings, we see our willing sin each and every day. Lord, in a world that often looks at how good we are, when we are true with ourselves, we see that we are not good. We fall short every day. We don't do as you want us to. We do the opposite. 
And Lord, when we see that truth, when we read your word, we are reminded that we are broken people. And yet even in our brokenness, even having broken your commands, we still find a hope in Jesus that overcomes all of that. A hope that is found that we have a Savior who has saved us from our sins. Who loved us enough to come and live perfectly so that we would have his righteousness. Who loved us enough to come and to take our punishment for our sin upon himself on the cross. And die that awful, terrible death so that we would be forgiven. Lord, what love that is. What mercy and grace we have found in you. And Lord, here today we find a hope. That carries us through the best and through the worst moments in our life. For the hope we have in you is eternal. And that is a hope that encourages us each and every day, wherever we might find ourselves. Lord, we are all going through different walks of life currently. Some of us have lived a healthy, long life. Have been blessed to see our children, our grandchildren, a good job in retirement. Others of us have seen tragedy after tragedy. Some of us are in the middle of life now with little ones. Some are just beginning. But Lord, no matter who we are, where we are at, we trust in your care. And we can come to you whether we are young or whether we are old and know that you will provide for us. And so, Lord, that leads us to come to you with our requests, with our cares, with our burdens, and lay them all at your feet. And here this morning, we come with our own. For some of us, it is physical health of ourselves of our loved ones for others it is a spiritual emotional burden that we are dealing with whether in our schools and our jobs for some it is a temptation with sin and a struggle that has gone on for a long time for some it is a general hopelessness when we see the way the world is see that it's continuing to fall away from you what might we do in it And for others of us, there are things that are on our hearts that no one knows but you. But Lord, whatever these things might be, we can take them all and give them to you and know that we are in your care. And trust that no matter what may happen tomorrow, we have a hope in Jesus Christ that can never be taken away. And so Lord, may you be our hope here today. Remind us of that hope in the moments when life gets hard. And may your spirit be in us to encourage us And to help us to overcome sin when it comes our way. To help us be lights in this world for Jesus. For Lord, when the world sees us, may they see that we are different. May we not live in the same manner. But may they see that we are your people. Who live according to your word. And who have been saved not by our good deeds, but by your grace and mercy. And Lord, may our lives be an example to them. So we might give them an an opportunity to come to know Jesus through our words and through our deeds. Lord, may you use our church. May you bless our church. May you continue to work in and through our church. Lord, help us to continue to grow. Grow numerically. Make more people come to know you. Make more people come to find a home here. Lord, may we also continue to grow spiritually. May we not be satisfied with simply just knowing what the gospel is, although it brings us hope and peace more than we have ever known. May we continue to grow closer to you each and every day, in our love, in our lives, and in so much more. Lord, may we be your hands and your feet here on this earth, and may you give us a willingness and a want to do just that. Lord, there are many other requests we have upon our hearts, and now we take a moment to offer them all to you in a moment of silent prayer. Now, Lord, when we are unsure of what to pray, we can always pray the prayer you taught your disciples praying. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. But everyone to stand together. Our next hymn this morning is number 188. Ride on, ride on in majesty.
You may be seated. The children come forward for the children's message.
No, right? Well, Jesus didn't give us because he was the perfect boy. We've been forgiven, and now we have a way to heaven. But we've got to trust him in order to get there. We trust what Jesus did to be, to be saved. Now, but now here's the next question. If Jesus has made us a way to heaven, does that mean we live however we want now? No, right? We try to live for him as best way we can. But whenever we fall short, we're still in there. He is perfect for us. So at least we still get to heaven through what he's done. So what I want you to do is the next time you have to take a step, a stairs, do the plain way. You guys are still too young. Maybe you're a little bit older than I have at this point. Remember, at the end of the day, we can't keep God's steps perfect because Jesus did for us so that we can be perfect. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you love us. We thank you that you sent Jesus to be the perfect way to put us. And we know he failed your test all the time and we fall short. But we thank you that Jesus kept it perfect, that we would be forgiven. And so Lord, I pray that you would help us in trying to live for you the best that we can. But even when we fall short, remember that you have already completed the chapter for us so that you have already saved us. And Lord, I'm sure we're going to live for you even now if we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. You guys want to head downstairs? I invite everyone to turn with me in your Bibles. Our scripture passage this morning comes from the book of Galatians, uh, chapter 3. We're looking at verses 10 through 14. And uh, as you're flipping there, as you've already seen by the songs we've sung and by the, the plant up here, today is Palm Sunday. And typically when we think of Palm Sunday, it is the Sunday before Easter. The day when Jesus rides into Jerusalem triumphantly before he would later die and rise again. And if you remember in that story here, as we kind of sang even in the first hymn, people are crying out, Hosanna! Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And it's interesting because the word Hosanna, some of you may or may not know what it means. The word Hosanna means, oh, save. And if you think about it, that's a perfect way of what these people are saying to Jesus. Because that is exactly what Jesus has come to Jerusalem to do, to save. But what is it that Jesus comes to save from? The Bible talks about that in many different ways. But in our scripture passage this morning, it focuses in on showing us how Jesus has come to save us all from a curse. In particular, the curse of our sin. And so as we go to his word to see how he's done that, may we get his help first. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your word. It is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. It guides us into the truths of who you are, who we are, and how we ought to respond. Lord, as we come to your word here today, we pray that your spirit would open our hearts and our minds to see your truth for what it is, to see you for who you are, and to see how this applies to us. May we take what it says and then love it and live it in our lives. And Lord, we pray above all that you would get the glory here this morning. And so, Lord, may you be with me in my brokenness. May your people hear you and be blessed, and may your name be praised in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, Galatians chapter 3, verses 10 through 14. Hear now God's word. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. So that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so we might receive the promised spirit through faith. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Amen. How many of you enjoy a good story? I would say most of us probably do. Whether it comes in the form of a book, a television show, a movie, I think many of us would enjoy getting lost in a different world. Some of us might prefer a more realistic uh, story down to earth, and others of us, like myself, like to be taken out of the world we live in into others. 
a world where you see heroes, where you see villains, good and evil, and a hero having to overcome something in order to win in the end. And you could quite easily see that in the culture we live in today. People like stories like that. If you just think about things like Lord of the Rings or Star Wars or all these superhero movies, whether you have watched them or read about them or simply just seen them, in all of these there's this common theme of good versus evil. How an empire needs to be overthrown, how a villain has to be stopped, or even so a quest to go and destroy a ring is the focus of these stories. And each of those, it's encouraging whenever the end gets to be what you want it to be, where the good thing happens, the good guys win. Or, you know, if those aren't your cup of tea, just simply think about a Disney movie for a second. Uh, Disney has a monopoly on stories like this. In particular, if you think about movies that have heroes whose task is not to necessarily beat a villain, but to break a curse. You think about Snow White for a second. She eats the poison apple. Therefore, she falls asleep and so needs a curse to be broken. Or Sleeping Beauty, kind of the same concept, except this time she pokes her hand, uh, her finger on a needle of a spinning wheel. Or Beauty and the Beast, where the prince is cursed to turn into a beast until the last petal of the rose falls. And I think when, whether we read books, whether we see these movies, it's an encouragement for us when we see finally that at the end of the movie, the end of the work, the curse is broken, where the hero is victorious. And as most books say, everyone lived happily ever after. And that's very satisfying when you see that. It wouldn't be satisfying if at the end of the book everybody died or the hero didn't win, the curse remained uh, as it was. And I think that's why we gravitate to things like that, because we enjoy that story. But as a good friend of mine said, I think there's another reason why we gravitate to stories like that, because we ourselves are living it. You know, we don't like to think about things like curses as real things. You know, that's why if your children are scared of it in, in, a, in a television show or a movie, you tell them, look, well, don't worry about it, curses aren't real. But although you might not have a curse that makes you fall asleep by a poison apple or a, uh, a needle... There is a curse that is ever-present in the world we live in today. A curse that, as the Apostle Paul shows us here in Galatians, that affects all of us. Because when you just simply stop and look at the world and look at its brokenness, I think it's easy to see that there is something wrong. When you see the hatred, when you see the violence, when you see the depravity of the world that we live in, I think it's very apparent that something is going on. And that something is that we're all under a curse because of our sin. And just like in a work like a Disney movie, the truth is we also need a hero to come and to save us from. And that hero is none other than Lord Jesus Christ, the one who comes into this world to break the curse that you and I can be set free from it. If we think about Palm Sunday, that's exactly what Jesus goes to do. He goes to break our curse. And in this passage, Paul tries to explain to us about what this curse looks like, of what it means for us, by first showing us, look, it's not something that we can break. Then it is something that Jesus can break. And finally, our response to it is to trust in Jesus, who is our curse breaker. Again, so we understand just the reason why it is that Jesus has come to save us. And so you talk about this curse I think the first thing we need to see is, how do we even know that we are under a curse? Look at verses 10 through 12. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith, rather the one who does them shall live by them. And so Paul answered the question, if you're thinking, well, how am I under a curse? Well, he takes us back to the book of Deuteronomy. But Deuteronomy 27, 26 tells us, as Paul quotes here, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things in the book of the law and do them. Now, if you look back at that passage in Deuteronomy, here you have the people of God. They have been wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. And so they are now on the edge of the promised land. 
And before they go in, God has a group of people go up on two different mountains. One on Mount Gerizim and the other on Mount Ebal. And on one mountain you have the people are shouting out blessings. And the other mountain they are shouting out curses. And these are not just random curses or blessings. You see, God, he has given his law to his people. He has given them the way they ought to live. And so the thing is, is if they obey and follow God's law, then the curses that they are, the blessings that they are shouting out, they will be blessed. But if they do not follow God's law as they should, then they will be cursed by it. And they will be cut off from God. And so the truth is, is nobody wants to be cut off. Nobody wants to be cursed. And so the people in those days, well, this is how we ought to live then. And it's not just true then, it's also true now. Because the same law that the people of God had back in the Old Testament is the same law that you and I have today. And so if we want to be blessed, we need to avoid breaking it. We need to obey God's commands as he calls us to do. But in order to do that, we have to know what his commands are. So where do we find that? Well, we go to God's word. His word tells us what he requires of us. His word tells us what is right, what is wrong. It doesn't matter what the world has to say about it or what you and I think about it. At the end of the day, what God says about it carries the most weight. And so if we are to do what is right and obey, we must follow what he has said, no matter what we think. But here's the problem. When you and I go to God's word and just read it for a little bit, we see that we haven't done as we should. We see, unfortunately, we have broken his commands. And because we've broken his commands, well, we have been cursed because we didn't obey it like we should. But I think we don't understand that. Because when we look at our lives, it doesn't seem like I am under a curse. It doesn't feel like I've been punished for anything. I mean, I haven't been put to sleep like Snow White did. You know, I don't really seem to be affected by it in any way, even though I'm not following God like I should. I've got a good job, I've got a nice house, I've got a wonderful family. Looking at my life, it doesn't seem like I am under a curse at all. Well, think about it like this. Last week we were talking about having a healthy spiritual diet. I think this kind of goes along with it in a way. There's an overweight person goes to the doctor. And the doctor tells him, look, you have a partially blocked artery. And if you don't change your lifestyle, you're going to suffer a massive heart attack and die. But let's say that the person ignores the doctor. He thinks that he, oh, I'm just fine. The doctor doesn't know what he's talking about. And so he continues to live as he was already doing. That unhealthy lifestyle is something that he chooses to do each and every day. And we can't be surprised that on one day, just like the doctor said he would, he does have a heart attack and he can't be saved. You see, that's kind of what this curse is. Paul's showing us, look, there is, you are under a curse. It might not seem like it, but in the end, it's going to lead to the wrath of God. Leading to an eternal punishment where there is only weeping and gnashing of teeth. Just like the man's clogged artery, you might not see it now. You might not be able to see God's judgment. You might think everything's fine. And we want to trust in ourselves. We want to trust in our idea of the truth and do ha- live however we wish to live. But the, tr- the real truth is, at the end of the day, If we ignore the fact that we have broken God's commands and sinned against him, we are indeed under a curse. And if we continue under that curse when our time comes, then we are going to be helpless to do anything about it whenever God is judging us. So what do we do about it? What's the solution? Then, Okay, if we're under a curse, we've broken God's commands, uh, what what do I do next to to get out from under it? Do we now start doing the right thing instead of the wrong thing? You know, we could try that, but that's a problem. See, the only other thing that we see here is that we can't break this curse ourselves. That's why he's talking here. He says, now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law. You see, Paul is writing to a group of Christians that have come out of, uh, uh, out of Judaism, and they are still thinking that, okay, the way to be saved is Jesus plus doing all these other things following the law. But what Paul is trying to say is, look, if you think that following the law is going to earn you a spot in heaven, you are dead wrong. Because the only way to earn a spot in heaven through the law is to follow it perfectly. 
The only way to not be under that curse is to keep everything 100% of the time throughout the entirety of your life. And there are many people today that think, I simply need to be a good enough person in order to get to heaven. But Paul addresses that type of attitude here in verse 11, again telling us, no one is justified before God by the law. You can't do it. You can't be good enough. It's not possible. The only way to earn your way to heaven is through a perfect life. And that's why verse 12 tells us, look, that the law is not of faith. For the one who does the law will live by it. The idea here of those that think they can earn their way to heaven, they will live or have eternal life by it, is to keep it perfectly. No mistakes, no slip-ups, not sinning even once. Just like I said with the kids, that would mean you'd be like you having a perfect grade on everything from kindergarten all the way through college. It's not possible. God is a perfect, holy God, and if we sin, we can't be in his presence, and all of us sin. And so sinning just once will bring about that curse. And therefore, it's impossible for all of us to earn our way to God, because we all sin. We might try our best, but we will all fail in the end. And that's why we have to realize that, yes, there's a curse, and we are utterly helpless ourselves before this curse, and can do nothing to save ourselves from it. But thankfully, we see God knows that as well. And so he has provided us a way that we can be saved from that curse that we're under. Which is the second thing we see, that after we, there's a curse that we can't break, we find that we see Jesus can break it. And in verse 13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. When Christ comes into the world at Christmas, it wasn't just by happenstance. He did it with a purpose. He came into the world in order that we would be freed from the curse of sin. And for that to happen, Jesus had to go and become a curse for us at Easter. And the reason for that is, as we've said, we have broken God's commands. And we deserve the punishment for that. We are under his curse. And the penalty of that curse is being under the wrath of God for all eternity. And unfortunately, this penalty is not something that can just be taken away that we can get get a do-over. Because God is a perfectly just God, and he cannot just wipe away sin and give us a chance. Sin must be punished. But instead of us having to pay it, we see that Jesus comes and pays it for our place. That's why the book of Romans tells us that God would be both just, sin would be paid for, but the justifier who would pay it for us. When you think about Jesus, Jesus does not have to do that. And he surely doesn't deserve everything he went through. See, Jesus did what we couldn't. He lived a perfect life. If anybody could earn their way to heaven, if anybody could be justified by their works, it's Jesus. He is the only one. He never sinned, not even once. He never broke God's law. He had truly earned the life that you and I could not earn. And yet, what he does is he gives that righteousness that he earned to us who can't earn it. And in turn, takes on the curse that we deserve so that we don't have to. He willingly comes into this world to redeem us, as verse 13 says. And the word redeem, it's often used in the slave market in Paul's day, where you would have somebody that had come under slavery, and it was used to talk about the purchase price for a slave. And so if if the person, if they have a family member or a friend who wants to set them free from captivity... They would have to buy them back. They would have to redeem them by coming and and paying a price so that they would be set free. And so most of the time, that that price, that ransom, would be to the highest bidder. And so they would have to come being prepared to give it all so that they would be set free. And in our case, when it comes to being set free from the curse of our sin, that's not something that money can buy. You can have all the money in the world, and still that would be not be enough. No, the price was even higher. Because we have been redeemed by the very blood of Jesus Christ, who gave his life as a ransom for us, so that we would be set free, that we would be redeemed. You see, that's why when he comes, when he is hanging on that cross, He is taking on that curse for us. That all of our sin, past, present, and future, will be placed upon him. And where he would experience the wrath of God that we deserve. As we saw in that first scripture lesson, 
The point of hanging a criminal like that out in public was to show people that they had committed a crime and so they would be shamed by it. And when Jesus' body is put on that tree, on that cross, it demonstrated that he himself was under God's curse. The curse we deserve. So as 1 Peter 2.24 says that Jesus himself would bear our sins in his body on the tree so that our curse would be broken. You see, it's very different from how curses are broken in books and movies. In Snow White, Sleeping Beauty, you have Prince Charming come in and break it with true love's kiss. In Beauty and the Beast, you see some, that Belle learns to love the beast. Or many other things, you see a ring is destroyed or something else. But the truth is here, our curse is not broken by a kiss. It's not broken by finding love. It's not broken by destroying a ring or slaying a monster. You and I are freed from the curse that we are under because Jesus Christ comes and takes on our curse himself. Being whipped, beaten, humiliated, suffering that terrible and agonizing death on the cross so that we would be saved, so that we would have our curse broken and now have a relationship with God as it should be. You see, Christ had to endure God's curse, the weight of all the punishment of our sin, so that we would be forgiven. And I think that's why that Jesus Christ should be our hero in everything. Because he is the hero who can do what we couldn't. He is the Savior, the one who dies so that you and I might be free. Where you couldn't do it, Jesus did it for you. Where you fell short, he succeeds. You know, often we would think, would we suffer and die for somebody? He might be our, our friends or family. But would you suffer and die for somebody that didn't know you? Would you suffer and die for people that hate you? I would say probably not. But that's what Jesus does. He dies for those who did not know him, for those that would curse him, so that through what he would do, we would find redemption. We would find forgiveness by repenting and turning to him. Jesus takes on your transgressions. He takes on your iniquities. And he pays your punishment so that your curse will be broken and you will be seen as righteous in God's sight. No story, no fairy tale can show you that kind of love that you see in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And what an amazing love that is if you would actually stop and think about it. But what do we do with it? That's the truth. Is we're, we can't save ourselves from this curse. Jesus can. Well, our response is to stop trusting ourselves. And instead, the last thing we see is we must put our trust in him. Go back to verse 11. It says, now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. Paul's referring back to the book of Habakkuk, reminding us that those who will be saved from this curse are those that don't trust in themselves, but put their trust in Jesus Christ by faith, so that we, they would be made righteous. And that means us, today, we don't rely on ourselves any longer, we don't rely on our abilities, we trust fully and solely in Jesus Christ alone for our salvation confessing we are not good enough and that's hard but we must and see that Jesus is turning to him as our redeemer who sets us free you see his action here requires our proper response and that is not, is not just believing that Jesus saves you from your sin yes that is a need part of it but it also means that you give your entire life over to him letting that trust and faith be seen in your life each and every day Quit trusting in yourself and your abilities and put your full faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and lean on him. And that's, again, that's hard. We, we live in a world that says, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. You do you. You be good enough. You can do it. And so we say that we trust in Jesus, but sometimes even in the back of our minds, we still think, well, I'm going to do this, this, and this to kind of help my case in heaven. But the truth is, is that's not how it works. You're still trusting in yourself, not in Christ alone. It's like if you were to have a boat in a dock, and you were to put one foot in the boat and keep one foot on the dock. 
And slowly but surely, that boat is going to be drifting away. And you have a choice to make. You can either A, put both feet in the dock, or on, in the boat, put both feet on the dock, or try to keep it in both. But if you keep one foot on both, what's going to happen? You're going to get wet. And that's what we try to do when it comes to trusting Jesus in ourselves. We put one foot in the boat with him, but then we keep the other foot on the dock in ourselves. And the more and more life happens, eventually we're going to get wet. And this reminds us that, look, our faith has got to be in Jesus. It can't be both sides. There's no way to put our trust in ourselves and put our trust in Christ at the same time. We can't say that, my, well, my good works will help me along with the work Christ has done. No, what Christ has done has saved us completely by what he has done. That's what Paul's trying to get across to the Galatians. Like, look, what Jesus has done for you is enough. There's nothing you can add to it, nothing you can do. Your salvation is in Christ and in Christ alone. And that, that is why you put your faith in him. Have you done that? Just look at yourself for a moment. Have you fully put your trust in Jesus Christ? Or are you consciously or subconsciously still trusting what you yourself are doing? Well, I come to church every Sunday. I've got perfect attendance. That'll get me somewhere. Or look at all the good things I do for God in my life. Or I put money in the plate every week. That's got to count for something. Or anything else other than Jesus. And while those things are not bad things, that is not what saves you. It is Christ and Christ alone that saves you. That breaks the curse that you are under. And have you trusted in Christ so fully that you know that it is only through what he has done that you can be redeemed? See, Paul here is reminding us, look, you need to trust in Jesus with your whole heart and let it affect all of your life. Because he is the only way you can be saved. He is the only way that your curse can be broken. And because that stop putting your trust in yourself, in your strengths, in your deeds, and put your trust in him and in him alone. And if you do that, then you find a salvation and a hope that can never be taken away. You see, that's the encouraging thing for us. It's right before this, Paul is drawing us back to Abraham in the Old Testament. That often the Jewish people look to as their father in the faith. But he's trying to remind them, look, Abraham wasn't justified by his works. He was justified before God by his faith. And just as he was justified by his faith, not only are the Jewish Christians now the same, but any Gentile, any of us who cast ourselves fully upon Christ will see the same blessing that Abraham himself had. That's why in verse 14 we see it gets better. In you, excuse me, uh, so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. What this is saying is if you have put your full trust in Jesus Christ, whoever you might be, this promise of Abraham, this righteousness by faith is yours. You could be a Jew, you could be a Gentile. It doesn't matter what you've done in your past. It doesn't matter your, your age, your race, your so social status, your gender, whatever it is. Whatever you've done. If you have put your faith in Jesus Christ, then you are now seen as righteous in God's sight. You yourself have received the promised Holy Spirit. The Bible talks about how the Holy Spirit is our down payment of the salvation we have in Jesus. And we can know that if we have His Spirit, then we can know that the salvation we have in the end is sure. And not only that, we can know that that same spirit working in us now helps us to follow God's law like we should each and every day. To do what we could not do on our own. That through the spirit working in us each and every day, we can follow him. So he will produce in us love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control, and so much more. To live a life that is holy and honoring to God. To follow his law. And in those moments when we still fall short, we can always remember that because of what Christ has done for us, our curse has still been removed. And that should encourage us even more to live for him. Not because we earn it, but because he has already earned it for us. That's only possible if you stop trusting yourself and start fully trusting Jesus. Because that's why he has come. 
That's why he has ride, wrote, ridden that donkey into Jerusalem to come and to save you from your curse. And I know this morning many of you know that truth. And that seems remedial. Uh, Pastor, I already know that. But the truth of this is that we need to remember this truth. Always. Don't take it for granted. Keep it at the forefront of your mind. It is foundational. Because without it, we have no hope. And if you think about it, that's the core of our faith is Jesus. If you go back to, there's a legendary football coach, many of you probably know, named Vince Lombardi. What he would often do is at the start of their preseason training, he would gather all the players together, and he would hold in his hand a football. And he'd say, gentlemen, this is a football. And you can imagine probably many of the players are thinking, well, yeah, we know what that is. We've been playing this game our whole life. But it was a reminder to all of them, look, these are the basics of what it means to be a football player. And without this football, you don't have the game. And it's like Paul is doing the same thing with Jesus. I think so often we get so wrapped up in our lives, we forget the central truth of why we need Jesus. And here it's like Paul is saying, look, ladies and gentlemen, this is Jesus Christ. Without him, you have nothing. But in him, you have everything. Because he is the one that makes us who we are. This is who he is. This is what he has done for you. You were under a curse because of your sin, but he is the hero who has come and broken it. He is the Savior who has entered into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, who, was, who died on Good Friday, and who has risen again on that first Easter morning. He is the one that has taken your sin upon himself so that by believing in him, you would be redeemed. And when you remember these truths, you are reminded yet again why it is you need Jesus. Because no matter how good we are in this life, none of us can earn our way to heaven. The only way to be saved, for our curse to be broken, is through faith in Jesus Christ. And for all of you here that do not truly know him today, may you put your trust in him. So that you would be forgiven, that you would be redeemed, that your curse would be broken. And for the rest of us here that do know that, again, may this be a reminder to us of why we believe what we believe of why we cast ourselves fully upon Christ, of why we have had faith in the first place. It's because of this Savior who has loved you enough to become a curse for you so you would be redeemed. A Savior who would ride into Jerusalem that first Palm Sunday so that we too might cry out with those people, Blessed be the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest Blessed is he, he who has come to save. And if we have had faith, blessed is he who is the one who has saved us already. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you again today and we are reminded of the grace we have been shown in Jesus Christ. We have been reminded of the curse that has been broken, that we cannot break ourselves, for we are sinners in need of a Savior. We are those who have fallen short each and every day, those who can never be good and perfect enough to earn our way to you, and yet you, knowing this, lovingly sent your Son into this world, that by your mercy and grace he would come and he would die in our place to take our sin, to take our penalty and our curse upon himself, so that we might be redeemed, we might be forgiven, that his righteousness would be ours, so that we would be restored to our relationship with you, so that we would have in him a living hope that would never die. And Lord, here this morning, may you remind us of that hope. May you remind us of the price that was paid for our redemption. And may you remind us that that is why we have faith. For it is not nothing that we do that we can save ourselves, but it is only through you and your Son that we can be delivered. And so, Lord, may you help us to have the faith we need here today to truly trust in you and to stop trusting in ourselves. And, Lord, to trust in you each and every day and seek to live for you by your Spirit working in us, that we might live a life that is glorifying and pleasing to you as the one who gave his life for us. And Lord, I pray that you would just remind us of your wonderful love and grace again this Easter season. Remind us of your love that sent your Son to die for us. Lord, that we might push your trust in you and then seek to live for you who gave it all for us. We thank you and we love you, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If I understand together, our final hymn this morning is number 187, All Glory, Laud, and Honor. Sing hills and hosts ring 
Again, may we remember the hope and the faith that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. And again, this afternoon, we'll have our egg hunt at 3 o'clock. We invite all to join. But now, may you receive the benediction of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. Amen.